Rebuilding a Vintage Open Steam Launch. This is part three. Having a look at the boiler, the hydraulic testing of the boiler, plus a quick tour of my workshop at the end. It's a little bit more than a quick look at the boiler. I'm getting the boiler ready for the hydraulic test, so I need to remove all of the ancillary equipment, apart from a couple of taps. This is what remains of the main steam feed to the engine, and this is no good at all. It doesn't have a lubricator, which is a bit of a puzzle really. I will be piping the feed to the engine in an entirely different way to the way it is at the moment, complete with a superheater, a displacement lubricator and a regulator. There's a small whistle on the chimney, which is currently piped to a valve on the boiler. This needs to be disconnected and this is what I'm doing at the moment. You can get problems when undoing union nuts on pipes of this age. Sometimes if the pipe is stuck to the union nut, as you undo the union nut, the thin pipe will also start to twist and then it will kink and break. But luckily I didn't have that problem in this case. Once the whistle pipe was disconnected from the boiler, it was very easy to remove the chimney. The blast pipe also removed quite easily, but I did have to bend the pipe to get it out of the boiler fitting. In this clip I'm taking a look at the clack valve. This is the valve that allows water into the boiler, but doesn't allow water out. It's a one-way valve, also known as a check valve. This one looks pretty corroded, and what I'm doing at the moment, with a little help from some penetrating oil, I'm removing the top cap to have a look inside it, to see whether the inside of the valve is just as badly corroded as the outside. And the good news is it doesn't look too bad inside the valve, but the stainless steel ball was firmly stuck to the seat. And now it's stuck to my screwdriver because the screwdriver tip is magnetic. You will notice that the entire fitting is full of lime scale, as well as the stainless steel ball that I've just put back inside the fitting. More about this later. This is the water gauge, and as soon as I touch one of the nuts on the water gauge, the glass shattered, which was no surprise. I'm going to replace the glass anyway. And I also notice that there's plenty of lime scale on this fitting too. I'm going to assess the fittings when I have them all on the bench in a separate episode, and then I think what I'll probably do is immerse them in my acid bath for a while, which will easily remove any lime scale. I do not use sulfuric acid in my acid bath. I use some stuff called Killrock K, which is kettle descaler, and this Killrock K used in a higher concentration than you would use in a kettle quickly dissolves any lime scale that's attached to any components. I mainly use my acid bath in the outer part of my workshop for dissolving the burnt on flux residue after silver soldering and very shortly this boiler which is obviously quite full of lime scale is going to sit in the acid bath to dissolve it. It was quite a surprise to me to find so much water in the boiler after the boiler in the boat has been left for so many years. The next part to remove is the pressure gauge so I carefully remove the banjo union and this clip shows me loosening the union nut with my Barco adjustable spanner. You will of course notice how the Barco adjustable spanner does not round the edges of the nut, mainly because of the width of the spanner, coupled with the fact that the sliding jaw is a really good engineering fit in the slide. As far as I'm aware, Barco invented adjustable spanners, and I still think they are the best. And with all the plugs that I give Barco on these videos, I think they should send me a set of them. I live in hopes. I do have another Barco spanner that I bought, a larger one. But I think this year, I'm going to treat myself and buy myself some more Barco spanners. I don't really need any more. The small one is over 30 years old now. But I thought I might buy one or two, just to annoy the experts who frequently comment on my channel and tell me off about using adjustable spanners. And once again, not unsurprisingly, you will notice a lot of lime scale in the siphon to the pressure gauge, and it's blocked. So I'm using a twist drill to unblock it. There it goes, it's no longer blocked. So now when I blow down the hole, some air comes out of the other end. I'll just bang it on the bench in an attempt to break free any more lime scale. In retrospect, I don't know why I did that, it just seemed like a good idea at the time. With the help of my very blunt craft knife, I'm removing the remains of a corroded aluminium washer. I'm going to replace these with copper ones. And now, by using my blunt craft knife again, I'm removing all the wooden cladding strips from the boiler. Now the boiler looks a thorough mess. But I do need to remove these strips because I cannot put the boiler in the acid bath with these on. Plus I need to have a good look how well the boiler's put together. And although I cannot formally issue a boiler certificate, 
I do need to see how well this pressure vessel has been made before I can personally pass it as serviceable. I've just removed the chimney housing, now I'm removing the steam tap, and now I'm carefully removing the top cap of the boiler, which supports the chimney housing. Time now to give everything a good clean to just get rid of the dust, so I can see how well the boiler's made. I must admit the boiler looked a whole lot better before I took the cladding off. As I'm going to re-plumb this entire steam plant, I'm just cutting the old copper piping out. I thought that this would be a good time to show what happens when you use aluminium washers on brass or gunmetal steam fittings. Now to be fair, these aluminium washers have been in use for some time, maybe 40 years or more. So I'm really not being picky. I always use copper washers because they don't do this. As you can see clearly in this current clip on screen, there is no structural integrity in this aluminium washer. It's just dropping from together in my fingers. I think the reason that the aluminium washers disintegrate over time, considerable time of course, is due to something called cathodic corrosion, dissimilar metals in contact with each other. In this clip you see me cutting the pipe in with a pair of side cutters, and this is the only way I can do it because the pipe was threaded through a hole in the firebox area of the boiler, so I couldn't just pull it through. And now it's time to remove the firehole door, which is quite a nice thing really. As this is not a coal-fired boiler, this is not strictly a firebox. I will refer to it as firebox, then you know that I mean the bit at the bottom end of the boiler, as opposed to the bit at the top end of the boiler, which I would simply refer to as the chimney. And this part is simply referred to as a boiler band. There are two of these on the boiler and both are now removed. Now I can get at the important parts of the boiler. I'm having a quick scrape around with my craft knife. And what I'm looking for is evidence of soft solder. If a silver soldered boiler leaks when it's first tested, then the builder may have used some soft solder to plug the leaks. And if the boiler gets overheated slightly, the soft solder melts and the boiler leaks. This is my acid bath. I'll just have a look in it. Oh yeah, it's okay, there's no one in there. Uh, there's nothing in there. And in this clip, I'm very carefully lowering the boiler into the acid bath. I'm lowering the boiler into the acid using a couple of pieces of silicone rubber tubing. This is very strong, and of course the acid doesn't eat it away. The boiler bubbles for a while, and this is not the effect of the acid, it's just the air coming out of the boiler, but the bubbling doesn't last for very long. Which means that the acid is now inside the boiler, eating away at all that lime scale. Despite the boiler being in the acid bath for 24 hours, it did absolutely nothing to the glue on the outside of the boiler, this had to be manually removed with a scraper followed by sandpaper. Flushing out the boiler in the garden with a hose pipe did nothing for my cold this morning. Now I'm back in the workshop, sat next to my radiator. It's nice and warm. The boiler's on the bench. The blanking plugs and connectors have been made and the funnel is in place, ready to fill the boiler with water. There is already a video on my channel about a hydraulic test on a boiler, but I think I'll just do another one. It's fairly important to get it right first time. If you do it wrong, you can cause great problems. I've already fitted an inlet union on the side of the boiler, but I'm opening the steam tap as well. This will let any air out and allow me to fill the boiler quicker. So now the boiler appears to be full of water. I'm replacing the funnel with the blanking plug, and I'm shutting the tap. Now I'm attaching the water pipe to the union in the side of the boiler. And now it's time to tighten up the union nut using my adjustable spanner, my barcode adjustable spanner. And I'm making sure that the nut on this union is tight. I do not want any water to leak out when I start to pump up the pressure. So it's quite important not to spill any water on the bench or anywhere near the boiler, because the whole point of this test is to see whether the boiler is watertight. And if there's any droplets of water on the bench, they could have come from the boiler, or there might have been some droplets that you spilt earlier. This part is very important, please listen carefully. The whole point of the hydraulic test is to put pressure into the boiler safely. So before you apply any pressure at all using the hand pump, you need to be certain that your boiler is full absolutely to the top with water. And that's why I refitted the steam tap at the very highest point of the boiler. And the reason for fitting the piece of silicone rubber tubing is that as the water goes into the boiler and displaces the air, eventually water will come out of the tap, and I needed the water to be away from the boiler, just as I mentioned earlier, so as not to confuse water on the bench with a potential leak coming from the boiler. 
I'm testing the boiler with a hydraulic pressure of 160 pounds per square inch, which is twice working pressure. During this test period, I had a good look around the boiler to see if there were any potential leaks, and the boiler's fine, there were no leaks at all. The pressure never dropped, the needle never moved in a downward direction. The only time the pressure gauge needle moved was when I opened the valve on the top of the boiler to release the pressure. You can see how quickly the pressure dropped once I opened the valve. I then placed the boiler on its side and drained the water back into a bottle, followed by removing the blanking plugs. Then I put the plugs back in my blanking plug box, ready for the next boiler test. And finally I removed the steam fittings from the boiler and put them back in one of the green boxes. In the other green box is all the cladding off the boiler which has to go back on. I'm not going to do it as part of this episode. I'm thinking of the best way to do this. You'll see it in due course. By way of a change, I'm going to finish this episode slightly differently. Quite a few viewers have requested, can I have a look round the workshop? I'm stood with my camera, panning round the workshop. It's full of very interesting things. Good machines and bad machines. The milling machine's not so good, but the old Boxford's good. And my Smart and Brown 1024 model lathe is very good indeed. Here is my ancient Taiwanese milling machine, which seems to do the trick really. My 7 and a quarter inch gauge tank engine was built using this and it seemed to be okay at the time. I use a very old Jacobs chuck which is very stiff for holding the milling cutters and because it's very stiff they never drop out of it. I do of course have a Clarkson milling chuck and I would of course use that if I was doing some serious milling. Above the Boxford lathe are some shelves. On these shelves are often interesting items. Some of them are projects yet to start, sometimes the projects that are finished. And in the corner, looking over everything, is my workshop robot. I call him CNC. One project I really need to finish. This has been sat here for a while, and I think that my Henry vacuum cleaner is trying to mate with it. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.